listening to episode 108 of Mita Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I am interviewing Dr. Scott Scher. Scott is an expert on hyperbaric oxygen therapy, specifically the mild form, which is typically done below 1.5 atmospheres of pressure. And he's also a methylene blue expert, which is pretty cool because that's a substance that's not very well known in the health community. And it's especially amazing in these times for its anti-pathogen effects. I first found Scott through a YouTube presentation at the Integrative Healthcare Symposium. And I thought it was a really great breakdown of HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Basically, he just went through the benefits of it in a really digestible way. And hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something that I kind of scoffed at over the years because I attended all of these health conferences, biohacking conferences, and I would see people lined up out the door to get these sessions done. You know, sit in a hyperbaric pressurized chamber with 100% oxygen for an hour or so. And then I got into Morley's work and utilizing oxygen and kind of connecting the dots of studying iron for years in relationship to Shilajit and kind of stacking these tools And at one point, I thought that there was no benefit to hyperbaric oxygen therapy because everyone's full of lipofuscin and iron from the acid rain and the iron-fortified foods and the tap water and the spring water and the well water. And when you add oxygen to a system with a ton of iron, you just get rust. You get oxidative stress. That's what rust is internally. But I think there's a balance, and I always come back to balance with health. I think that's the sustainable route to go. And if you have bioavailable copper coming in from oysters, from beef liver, either the real thing or desiccated, and from whole food vitamin C, you know, honey, camu camu, amla, like in my dissolve it all supplement, berries are generally a concentrated source of whole food C. Well, whole food C has copper in it. And it has the tyrosinase enzyme, which is like an engine for copper. So if you have all these things going on and you're on Shilajit and you're aware of iron, you're not drinking unfiltered water, then I think that HBOT therapy can have a huge effect. And that's what I've been experiencing For over a month now, I've been using my chamber, and I'm pretty blown away at the effects. I go into that a little bit in the interview, and so I'm just going to jump in and let Dr. Scott break it down for us. Enjoy. I'm here with Dr. Scott Scher. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Matt. How are you today? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing? You're all oxygenated? <laughs> ah, I'm at an oxygen, I'm an oxygen infused location at the moment, actually. <laughs> Pressurized room. <laughs> yeah, not this room, but I know where those are. I can go if I need to. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm really grateful to have connected with you. Uh, I think Maybe even years ago, I I came across, I think, one of your interviews or YouTube videos. And uh, Mm -hmm. recently, I watched the uh, HBOT presentation at the Integrative Healthcare Symposium. It was 2018. I thought that was a great kind of overview that you did, a lecture on hyperbaric therapy. Thank you. Yeah, it it was an opportunity for me to be at an integrative conference and 
throw hyperbaric therapy into that integrative umbrella in the sense that that's how I practice hyperbaric therapy. It's not just about getting into a chamber. It's about optimizing before, during, and after hyperbaric therapy, and sometimes not even getting into a chamber at all if it's not appropriate. Although I like to say it's not if you need a chamber, it's, it's when kind of thing. I think everybody can benefit from it, but no matter if you're the sickest of the sick or the healthiest of the healthiest, there's, there's a, a reason and there's a potential way hyperbaric therapy can help you optimize and, and facilitate healing, recovery, uh, synergize with other therapies, et cetera. That's awesome. Yeah, years ago, I worked at a scuba diving shop uh, for a couple of years and uh, did a lot of stupid stuff because I was like a <laughs> yourselfer and I bought a, a used dry suit awesome. on eBay. Like it was like a rainbow, purple, pink dry suit. And I guess the Pretty. valve was clogged, right? <laughs> it looked just like an Austin Powers outfit. And uh, yeah, went out in La Jolla, San Diego with my buddy and yeah. basically shot up like a cork from about 70 feet because I couldn't vent the air. And so oh, wow. uh, feet were above me and I just shot straight up to the surface. Oh, and luckily I remembered the CISA, you know, controlled emergency surface ascent. And so just, ah, you know, so I kept my lungs open and didn't burst Good. my lungs. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And then, yeah, at the shore, the paramedics were with me basically for what felt like two hours trying to convince me to go for a, a chamber ride, I think they call it. Right. That was, right, go to the chamber. I, I think that's where most people hear about hyperbaric oxygen to, you know, to treat the bends, right? If you Right, decompression go. illness. Yeah. Yeah. Did you end up getting into the chamber? I didn't. Uh back then I was I was green juicing and I thought that was the cure for everything. And they were scaring <laughs> me and saying, you know, bubbles could pop years later and cause permanent brain damage and all these things. And trapped air and yeah. stuff and i was like i got it and i'm still it here it sounds so. like you were undeterred yeah okay yeah i mean you're right um <laughs> hyperbaric therapy was first described and used as a treatment for decompression illness or the bends and it was back when they were building bridges in the 1880s the brooklyn bridge actually is a very famous example where they had these divers underneath the water digging out the pylons or the the, the underwater ground for where the the pylons were going to go and they were in these sunken down like containers kinds of things. And they would pump air into them to keep them open so that water wouldn't get inside. And they had these like elevators that came up and down. And they noticed that if people came up from these elevators, sometimes they would get these very severe symptoms. Even actually one of the main architects of the Brooklyn Bridge got paralyzed from decompression illness. And they didn't really understand what was going on until actually just a couple of years later when it was described that it was actually these nitrogen bubbles that were making a gas out of a liquid. So nitrogen's in our system and it's in our bloodstream. It's liquid nitrogen. But if you decompress, if you come out of this pressurized environment very quickly, the, the nitrogen turns in from a, from a liquid into a gas and those, these gas bubbles block circulation. And these circulation blocks could manifest as seizures. It could kill you if it's going to block off a lot of blood flow to your brain. It can cause uh, severe, like severe muscle spasms, it could really cause like almost any neurologic thing that you could even imagine. And so what they realized, though, is if you, if you went back into these, uh, these containers that were sunk down deep underneath the ocean, and you hadn't been killed, of course, before you, when you got the bends, you went back in, the next day, your muscle pains went away. Your sort of even if you've had a seizure, when you got out of the chamber the day before, you went back in, the seizures went away because you were now repressurized to that environment underneath the sea. And all that pressure that was above you because you were sunk down deep underneath the ocean uh, made those nitrogen bubbles go back into circulation into a liquid form. And so when they realized this, hyperbaric therapy was developed in diving locations and also for the U.S. Navy, of course. And it really became a, a major treatment when they were able to uh, figure out a way to concentrate oxygen and pressurize oxygen as well. Because if you could put somebody on 100% oxygen, and then pressurize them back into an environment that simulated the pressure that caused the diving injury, then you would make that injury go away much faster and potentially much more complete than if you were just pressurizing them back to the same environment without increasing the amount of oxygen as well. Wow, that's super cool. Um, how, how long have you been studying all this stuff? Because you, uh, so you're super knowledgeable about uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I know my O2. Yeah. So, well, I, 
I started learning about hyperbaric therapy when I was in medical school, actually. I grew up the son of a chiropractor, pretty alternative. I didn't know what a box was. I had no medications. I think my first antibiotic was when I was 14 and I was sleep away camp and I got strep throat or something. And it was, it was something that just wasn't in my, in, in my purvey. I went to my father's office every day as a kid. I would hang out in the waiting room and I would see people get adjusted, change their diet. And then all of a sudden they didn't need any medications. They didn't need to see doctors. And, and so that's how I kind of grew up. And then I decided to go to medical school because I thought there was significant limitations on what he was doing as a chiropractor. And also I was like, well, there's probably a way to kind of use the conventional system as well and, and kind of talk out of both sides of my mouth, the alternative side that I grew up understanding and then the more conventional side of, of, of medical practice. And it was a huge chasm. It still is, but it's much less than it was 20 or 30 years ago when I went to college and then to medical school. And uh, I decided that I was going to figure out this way to bridge this chasm, like this major, uh, this major rift between conventional and alternative medicine. There weren't any functional medicine doctors at the time. There wasn't even, the word integrative didn't exist. My father's clinic was called, what was it called? Um, like a wellness clinic, right? So wellness was like a big alternative word, but and but there is this huge rift change or distinction between the two so i go to medical school and i'm in a place called shock trauma which is in baltimore the the place where everybody goes if you've had shock or trauma gunshot wounds uh, some of the burns carbon monoxide poisoning severe infections even sometimes as well and so i was training there i was rotating there through my third year of medical school and uh, i saw that well, first of all, it was crazy. Uh, I was there, let's see, every three nights I was on call for 30 hours and it was a 30 hour shift. Can you hear me okay, Matt? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you sound good. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Yeah. Making sure. um, <laughs> so every three hours, sorry, every thir three nights I was on call for 30 hours. And when I was on these nights and really e exhausted from my time there, I would get to go, and, but I would, I would kind of sleepily go around and see what was going on in other places of the shock trauma center. And one of the places that was uh, very sort of secret almost was that there was this huge submarine looking thing in the basement called the hyperbaric chamber. And they were bringing people in there that had uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, severe burns, severe infection. And I saw some of these people go into the chamber that looked like they were going to die, especially these patients with carbon monoxide poisoning. They were, we would act sometimes even be on ventilators. So they had to have a, a tube down their throat to help them breathe. And by the time they finished their hyperbaric session, they were able to walk out of the chamber. So they had been extubated, the, the ventilator, uh, the tube had been taken out inside the chamber and they walked out of the chamber on the other side of it. And when I saw that, and I also saw the people with severe infections that looked like they were gonna get their limbs amputated, not get their limbs amputated. And a couple other things in the chambers, I was like, what is going on in this chamber? What the hell could make somebody look like they were about to die, allow them to walk out afterwards? And so I started talking to the technicians and I started speaking to some of the physicians that were involved. And I realized it was just a combination of increased atmospheric pressure and increased inspired oxygen, combining the two together to cause these dramatic shifts in people. And when they told me this, I was like, just those two things can just do what I saw in the chamber and with these patients. And I was like, I need to learn more about this. And so I, on like my one day off that rotation, I remember going and going on my computer and like researching about hyperbaric oxygen therapy and seeing what it was being used for around the world. And that's when I realized that this is really something that I could use as a way to kind of anchor myself between the integrative or the, the alternative and the conventional world because there was 14 indications that were approved by insurance companies in the United States. And there was about 50 or so that had great data behind them that could be used in a more integrative way as I realized over a longer period of time as I did more research that I could potentially create a practice around it. That's amazing. And it really seems like a synergizer of you know because nutrition you know movement um you know making sure you you stay balanced emotionally and keep mentally mental stimulation and all that's important for health but 
if you combine hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, people could see really fast uh, or, or I guess accelerated healing, right, from a lot of chronic conditions. Yeah, I think what it comes down to is the simplicity of the technology, Matt. It's just a combination of oxygen and pressure. And so when you combine oxygen and pressure together, you drive more oxygen in circulation. And by doing that, you cause a basically a, a whole cascade of effects. There are immediate effects of the infusion of oxygen, and there are the more long-term benefits of an oxygen infusion protocol. The key is understanding, though, is that you know, oxygen that we're breathing now at sea level, at least me here in California, is there's 21% oxygen in the air that you're breathing. The rest of that air that you're breathing is mostly nitrogen. And at sea level, we call that zero atmospheres, actually one atmosphere absolute is the equivalent of, of that in my, in my terminology. But anyway, you're at zero feet of seawater. Now, if you go 33 feet below the sea in the seawater, all that water above you is exerting a pressure on you. It's a very heavy substance. If you picked up a bucket of water, for example, and try to carry a bucket of water, it's heavy. You pick up two or three, it's even heavier. Now, you know, millions of buckets of water above you when you're 33 feet below it. Now, you don't feel that pressure as much because you're weightless in the water. You're very buoyant in it for the most part, unless you're scuba diving and you have a pack on you and you're just, you know, floating not so much and you're just going down. So, but anyway, for the most part, you're just floating in the water and all that water is exerting a significant pressure on you. And so we use that pressure in a hyperbaric chamber and simulate the pressure you would feel under a certain amount of seawater. And then we combine it with increased, uh, increased inspired oxygen. So again, 21% oxygen that we typically will breathe at sea level, we can increase that to up to 100% if we want to. Now, typically oxygen is carried on red blood cells. Red blood cells uh, have a molecule on them called hemoglobin. Um, in each red blood cell, there are 250 million hemoglobin molecules. And each hemoglobin can bind four oxygen molecules. And so each of your red blood cells can carry 1 billion oxygen molecules, which is pretty cool if you think about it. But so typically, we have enough oxygen carrying capacity in our red blood cells to maintain our, all, all of our physiologic function. So if you have a normal, normal lungs, you ha typically have a pulse oximeter. It's like one of those things you put on your finger that measures arterial oxygen concentration it'll typically measure somewhere between 96 and 100%. And that's in somebody that has normal lungs. And that's what that's measuring is the amount of oxygen that's bound to your hemoglobin, to those hemoglobin molecules that's, that are in your red blood cells. In a hyperbaric chamber, uh, we have another way to increase oxygen carrying capacity. Now, the most common way is to increase your red blood cell mass. So the number of red blood cells you have in circulation is the more red blood cells you have in circulation, the more oxygen you can carry. Plain and simple, each red blood cell can carry 1 billion oxygen molecules. So you have a couple extra, you, a couple extra billion oxygen molecules. Kind of important. So there's a couple ways to do that to increase red blood cell density or mass. You can go altitude training. So if you go at low oxygen environments, you increase the stimulus for more of these red blood cells to be created. If you uh, if you take a drug called epigen, EPO, which is the, the drug that will, cyclists will use and other athletes that are looking to get that edge in their performance, which is not legal, as we know, is uh, it's something it, that can be legal if you have a specific condition, but not for cyclists and for endurance racing and stuff like that. That also increases the red blood cells, uh, the number of red blood cells in circulation. Now, in a hyperbaric chamber, we're not increasing the number of red blood cells in circulation. We're actually pressurizing your blood vessels and pressurizing your lungs and driving oxygen into the plasma or the liquid of your blood. And it's the liquid of your blood that has very little oxygen in it at sea level and that we can increase the amount of oxygen circulation by 1200% or even more by harnessing the power of that liquid in your bloodstream to carry oxygen to where it needs to go. Now, so to, to bring it all together, we have increased atmospheric pressure combined with increased inspired oxygen driving more oxygen into circulation into the plasma or liquid of your blood. And that has two effects, is sort of the immediate effect of an in increased infusion of oxygen in circulation. And then there's the 
more long-term benefit of the oxygen infusion protocols, which are more happening on the epigenetic side of things, which is how shifts in DNA expression of various genes that are responsible for growth and healing and decreasing inflammation are kind of being harnessed there. On the acute side of things, on the immediate side, though, Matt, that's where we see a lot of the benefit for some of the more acute indications of hyperbaric therapy. The things where you have like a like uh, like all of a sudden a lack of blood flow that causes you know, some sort of damage to tissue, whether it be like a stroke, a heart attack, a traumatic brain injury, um, an acute trauma to your limbs, uh, acute you know, traumatic injury anywhere, basically. Um, so anything acute. Hyperbaric therapy is going to create the stimulus and more oxygen in circulation, decreasing inflammation, getting more oxygen to the tissue, starting the whole immune system response, cleaning up the, the tissue, et cetera, creating more uh, of this, this substance called the easy water, which maybe you've heard of before, which is something that was described by Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington. And, and what that means is creating more flow in the tissue. And so more flow into tissue and more flow out of tissue. So I've been talking a while, so I'm going to shut up. How, do, what, how are we doing so far? <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, yeah, I took a bunch of notes. Uh, that was a great explanation. And uh, the EPO thing was fascinating. Uh, I think it's called a erythropoietin. And I've had yes. Morley Robbins on the show like seven times. He's like the magnesium copper iron man. He like, you know, says there's 84 plus minerals, but only three really matter, magnesium, copper, and iron. Those are just master regulators of a lot of stuff. But what I learned from him is that uh, EPO is actually increased dramatically after you donate blood, after you give mm -hmm. blood. Um, so have you, have you had, have you done, pro cause I know you design protocols for hyperbaric. Like, have you tried that? Like have someone donate blood and then go into a chamber right after or something or. Well, that's interesting. I mean, because when you're in a chamber, you're, you're going to get massively infused with oxygen, right? So you're certainly not going to have a stimulus for epigen to be, uh, to be increased in, in the body. In fact, it's likely going to be downregulated a little bit. So it's something I've got, I get the question a lot, does hyperbaric therapy help with anemia, like a low blood count? And it helps in the short term because it infuses all that oxygen in circulation. So it'll make you feel better. So like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, that don't want transfusions, need to be temporized. Hyperbaric therapy can be very helpful because it can temporize your need for for red blood cells. And in fact, at three atmospheres of pressure, Matt, which is the equivalent of 66 feet of seawater with 100% oxygen that you're breathing, you no longer need red blood cells to maintain your physiologic function. So like we can infuse so much oxygen in your plasma that you don't need any red blood cells at all. And so this is used therapeutically, as you can imagine, in people with severe trauma and hemorrhage and Jehovah's Witness and things like that. But it just gives you a sense also of how much oxygen is really able to get into circulation. Uh, the, the way that I've used or thought about using uh, transfusions or uh, donating blood in the past is that what happens a lot with cyclists and others that are in endurance sports, although it's not talked about, is that they will actually donate blood about 90 days or so before races and then reinfuse that blood right before a race to increase their oxygen carrying capacity. And so we know that, that that's kind of like a twofold benefit for the reason you mentioned, because once you donate blood, epigen is also going to be stimulated to give you more to replenish the blood that you've just taken out. And at the second, the secondary part is that now you've inf infused yourself or retransfused yourself all that blood that you took out. It's sort of like double the pleasure, double the fun, as they used to say with double mint gum. So <laughs> I haven't used that reference since I was like seven years old, but Anyway, um, but that's like sort of the, the synergistic potential there. Now, you know, epigen itself as a hormone, um, I haven't used it so much in combination with, with hyperbaric therapy for the reasons I've mentioned. But there certainly could be a way where if you are going to donate blood, um, in, in fact, you know, probably, Matt, I would recommend not going into a chamber if you just donated blood. And the reason for that is that the epigen, in, epigen, epigen stimulus of having less uh, less red blood cell oxygen circulation might get down regulated if you go into a high oxygen environment, because all of a sudden now you have more oxygen in circulation, you're in the chamber, it might decrease your stimulus of epigen that you would want from giving blood. Interesting. Yeah. I, 
it's my understanding it takes 30 days to build new blood after you donate roughly an average of like a month so um and and takes kind of backing 90 up days. 90 okay i was a little off <laughs> so, yeah. yeah it takes about 90 90 days to, to make new, new red blood cells so basically every 90 days you have completely new red blood cells we completely recycle all of our red blood cells every 90 days or so awesome Okay. Um, and with the atmosphere thing, so you mentioned 66 feet is three atmospheres. So it's 33. Yes. Two atmospheres or? Yeah. Sorry, 30, 33 feet of seawater is the equivalent of, I'm um, sorry. Yeah. Yes, you were correct. 66 feet of seawater is the equivalent of three ATA, which is in our parlance, the same thing. And so, which is the same as 10 meters of seawater, the same thing. Our okay. typical protocols are anywhere between 1.3 atmospheres and 2.4 to 2.8 at its max. 1.3 atmospheres is about 10 or 11 feet of seawater. And then 2.4 atmospheres is about 45 feet of seawater. That's our main therapeutic window for most of our hyperbaric indications, except for things like uh, diving injury, decompression illness, uh, and a couple other, some of the more acute things like carbon monoxide poisoning. Awesome. Okay. And uh, one thing I wanted to uh, bring up is I think from your lecture, uh, one of the things that stood out was basically the idea that um, if there's a blood vessel, then oxygen can only get so far into the tissue if it's if it's functioning. But right. what what uh, hyperbaric does is it kind of will double that distance that oxygen can diffuse. Do I have that right? Quadruple. Yeah, quadruple, can quadruple wow. the distance. Yeah, because. That's, that's a good point. So when you're infusing a lot more oxygen in circulation, the distance that it can travel outside of a blood vessel is going to increase as well because there's more oxygen to diffuse out. And it's not like the body doesn't regulate this in a very, very fine-tuned way. It's, it's very, very fine-tuned. So you will get oxygen where there's oxygen debt. And so that's why combining a hyperbaric therapy where there is an oxygen debt in a certain tissue that you're looking to heal can be very beneficial because more of that oxygen is going to hone into that particular tissue and try to help it heal. And as a result of getting more oxygen in the blood vessel, you're able to diffuse more oxygen into the tissue beds around those blood vessels, up to four times, uh, four times further in depth from that blood vessel. And so, yeah, that's a huge amount more tissue that you could potentially save if it's an acute indication, like an acute stroke or a heart attack or something where every all the tissue downstream of a blockage is now at risk of potentially dying. Now you've infused a whole bunch of hyperbaric oxygen in there. And so you're able to diffuse that oxygen further into the tissue that may be at risk. And so it's actually being used in, the, in this way in therapeutic, in research as well, in, in, in patients with traumatic brain injuries and heart attacks and, uh, and strokes. But often, I mean, as you can imagine, the first step, of course, is addressing the stroke the heart attack, the traumatic brain injury, or whatever, and then getting them in the hyperbaric chamber as soon as possible, for example. Uh, one a good example of this, Matt, is that there's a, there's a phase three study that's going on now called the HOBIT trial, H-O-B-I-T. Uh, but they did a phase two where they did three hyperbaric sessions, the first 72 hours in patients that had severe traumatic brain injuries. So it was uh, in, on day one, two, and three, 60, session, 60 minutes in the chamber, at 1.5 atmospheres. And then after the 60 minutes in the chamber, they gave them three hours of 100% oxygen on a face mask. And this is based on research they did in the 1990s, actually, on animals. But the mortality rate in those patients that got hyperbaric therapy that had severe traumatic brain injury was 50% less than the ones that didn't. And the morbidity or the, the major uh, injuries or like the long-term injuries that that people got because of these injuries was, was one third less than they would have if they not gotten hyperbaric therapy. So significant improvements in mortality and morbidity, as we call it. This is just three hyperbaric sessions the first three days that people had these acute traumatic brain injuries. And so now they're doing a phase three trial to validate their, what they found in the, in the phase two trial. And I do think that this is going to completely change how we, uh, how we approach traumatic brain injury, especially acute TBI. But I think that it's also going to, it's also kind of, the idea is the same for people that have mild or moderate traumatic brain injury. It's just that 
they don't have severe TBI, so they're not in the study, but the same benefits, I believe, are likely going to be helpful. And that's what we're seeing already in the people that we see for traumatic brain injury uh, and people in, in, in both the acute setting when they get the acute traumatic brain, brain injury and helping them heal faster, but also in people that have long-term uh, long challenges because of uh, brain injuries that happened you know, months or years ago as well. That's incredible. That's really cool. Um, yeah, I think you're aware I had created like a little health protocol because I've been studying longevity for like a little over a decade now and always learning. But I think that calcification, lipofuscin and fibrosis are three big deals that aren't talked about enough, especially in the context of aging and brain health and blood flow mm -hmm. and oxygen flow. And mm -hmm. um, I, I keep thinking of that when you're talking about hyperbaric because uh, uh, you know, drinking spring water, or hard water, or well water, and then, you know, seed oils and just the iron fortified foods. And to me, I, th I think most people on the planet are full of these three things. And mm -hmm. um, so I would say most people have mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, right? Because if oxygen can't get to the neurons, I mean, certain parts of our brain will die, right? I mean, that was really what excited me the most about this therapy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely the ability to reoxygenate the body. And when you can reoxygenate the body and get that oxygen to more of the tissue that may not be getting as much as it, as it needs, but it's not dead, because that's typically how our brain works. It's not like, it's like a gradation of injury from a stroke or a TBI or even just chronic inflammation. There's gonna be sort of areas where there's the most, and then there's a gradation sort of out from that sort of nidus or that central area or multiple central areas or whatever, depending on the, the condition and, the, and the, the process. But when you can get more oxygen to these tissues, then what happens is that the mitochondria start coming back online. The, the mitochondria that use oxygen to make energy. And then that's maybe what sort of the elephant in the room has been that we haven't spoken about is that why do we even need oxygen anyway? The idea is that oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the, on the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, right? So without oxygen, we can't make we can't make energy. We can't make ATP very effectively. There are other ways to do it, but you can't do it very effectively. And so what are the substrates for you know, making oxygen or making energy effectively? Of course, we know that there's proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. There's byproducts like lactate, for example, especially in the brain that are very important to make, uh, to make energy effectively. And so, but what oxygen does is it allows you to make energy the most efficiently because it's the most efficient way of making energy per you know, molecule of glucose or fat or whatever is by using the oxidative phosphorylation uh, electron transfer chain. And so what we do in the, in the mitochondria is a couple things by getting in the chamber. I mean, the first really is that you're getting more oxygen to the mitochondria. And as a result of that, you're creating the ability for it to make energy more effectively. So if the, if the, the cell is not making energy effectively, it doesn't have enough oxygen to, as a substrate. Now you're giving it more substrate. It's going to make it more effective. And then as a result, the cell is going to regenerate itself. Uh, and we actually are seeing this as well in some of the studies that have happened in, these, in the hyperbaric literature. Uh, the down reg See, we don't know exactly what happens with these cells, but I think what happens is they likely regenerate. There are cells called um, zombie cells or senescent cells. And these are cells that build up over time and Maybe the result of what you're, desc you're, descri you're describing, Matt, with the CLF and as well. And these are zombie cells or these cells in our body that don't, uh, they don't replicate anymore. They don't divide. They don't really have any purpose except they cause inflammation. And they're, uh, they're at risk, as, as you have more of them, the higher risk you have for cancer, for degener degenerative disease, atherosclerosis, all that kind of stuff. And so they did a study recently where they saw that getting into a hyperbaric chamber decrease the population of these cells. And I think what's happening is that we're actually regenerating the mitochondria in them. And we're doing that by increasing the amount of oxygen that they can use. But the other thing we're doing, which is very interesting, is that we're causing oxidative stress on the mitochondria as well. And what I mean by that is we're creating reactive oxygen species as a result of being in a high oxygen environment. And as a result of these reactive oxygen species, the mitochondria have to they have to uh, find a way to make themselves more efficient. If they can't, then they kill themselves and new ones are made. And so there's these interesting ways that we can actually modulate that in the chamber. 
And the reason for that is that if you're on, if you're in a high oxygen environment, and then you simulate being in a regular oxygen environment, the, the body actually releases certain factors, something called hypox, hypoxic inducible factor, HIF, that makes it seem that you're actually in a low oxygen state. And when you're in a low oxygen state, that stresses the mitochondria to make more of them, to replicate themselves. So we have, to sum up, we have this oxygen coming in that's making the mitochondria more efficient. We have this oxygen coming in that's causing more oxidative stress, that's making the, the mitochondria more efficient. And then we have this stimulus where the, the mitochondria think that it's seeing less oxygen for periods of time because you've now just been in a high oxygen environment. Now they're creating something called HIF or hypoxic inducible factor stimulus, which is creating more mitochondria uh, to be uh, creating the stimulus to make more mitochondria. So it's got these sort of like three things that it's doing. And I think as a result of that, you're having this population of cells, cells called these senescent cells that are going away inside the chamber. So to sum up what's happening at the cellular level in the mitochondria is three things because of getting into a hyperbaric chamber. The first is that we're getting more oxygen to the mitochondria. And as a result, that's going to make more energy. And so the cells are going to become more efficient, maybe come back online if they weren't getting enough oxygen before. So that's number one. Number two is that we're creating oxidative stress on the mitochondria as well. And as a result of that stress, the mitochondria have to react by making themselves more efficient in their processes of making energy. And oxidative stress is not a bad thing, of course. If it's in too large a quantity, it can be, and we can talk about that. And that's something important before you get into a hyperbaric chamber, actually. And the third thing is that because what's happening in the chamber is that we're getting you in a chamber that has more oxygen, as soon as you come out of the chamber, or there's various ways to stop getting more oxygen in the, a chamber while you're in it, something called air breaks, which we can talk about too, it's causing a stimulus of something called hypoxic inducible factor, HIF. And when HIF is being released, it's the same thing that's released if, as if you were at altitude, for example, and creates this stimulus to create more mitochondria, so mitochondrial biogenesis. So you're getting new mitochondria that are being formed as a result of being in a chamber and having it be as a simulation of you going into a low oxygen environment, even though you're not really in a low oxygen environment, you're just going back to a normal oxygen environment. So that's how HIF kind of plays into it as well. And, and HIF not only plays in it, into it for making new, stem, new mitochondria, but also as a stimulus for making more stem cells release in the body too. And there's an exponential number of stem cells that are released under hyperbaric conditions because of the oxidative load of all this oxygen being infused, along with HIF being released because of this relative hypoxia, as I've described it. That's really cool. And um, the endogenous uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species that we create um, are way less harsh than like peroxy nitrite from like non-native electromagnetic fields like Wi-Fi and stuff or hydroxyl radicals, right? Like yeah. these are more mild in their effects? Yeah, these are more stable radicals. Yeah, these are typically formed into hydrogen peroxide. Um, and in general, they, uh, the radicals don't last very long. Typically, they form water very quickly. But if there's other things around that would potentially uh, elicit a more oxidative response, so if there's if there's if there's toxicity, if for whatever reason, if there's uh, like if there's lots of unbound iron, for example, are there, and you have a lot of IV, IV vitamin C, you can make the Fenton reaction and make more unstable, um, more more unstable radicals. You you are going to make some of this regardless. But typically, the body has a very robust system and antioxidant reserve. And so what happens after about three hyperbaric sessions is that you have the equivalent uh, antioxidant surge as you've had oxidative load. And so, but during that three days is when you have a significant amount of, of sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a rebuilding or a um, remodeling of the system in a way that makes it more optimal. And then the antioxidants come in and mop up all the anion and all the oxidant oxidants there to make sure that there's no long term, uh, no long term issues for having the oxidative load that you've had under hyperbaric conditions. So yes, the 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 the, the free radicals that are made are, are more stable. They typically are very easily uh, they're very easily uh, balanced with antioxidant load that we can 
create on our own if we have the capacity. That's It's a big deal though, Matt, because whenever I'm addressing this with patients or clients, it's really about understanding, do they have the ability to, to sort of mount that antioxidant capacity once they've had the oxidative load? Because if they can't, then they can feel worse. They can feel sick. They can feel more tired. They can feel groggy. Now, oftentimes in people that are going to deep pressures, for example, that'll happen with everybody to a little bit because the body has that oxidative load. And then after about two or three treatments, it kind of equilibrates itself. But if you have a lot of ongoing infection, a lot of the ongoing inflammation, if you don't have antioxidant reserve, you can get into trouble. And I've seen that enough times to know when I don't want to put somebody into a chamber, except if it's an acute indication, if they've had an acute trauma or acute reason, then you just have to make sure you support their system as best as you can alongside of getting into the chamber. I like to call it like my educationally throwing the shit at the wall strategy, which is I don't have time to test anything, but I'm just going to give you what I think that you'll likely need so that we can get you through this and help you heal as fast as possible. That's awesome. And um, another note I made uh, from earlier is I didn't know this until I actually listened to you talk about hyperbaric therapy that a tissue, like a necrotic tissue coming, getting oxygen again, um, HBOT will actually prevent damage caused from that coming back online because. If it comes back online, I forget the process, but damage mm -hmm. can occur, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's something called reperfusion injury. And mm -hmm. so what that means is that, like, pretend you have a blood vessel, blood's flowing through it very nicely, and all of a sudden, it just stops, okay? The blood stops, and it can't go any further. And so downstream of that blockage, say like it's a part of your brain, for example, okay? All that downstream tissue that was fed by that blood vessel is now not able to get oxygen, not able to get anything from the blood, but especially oxygen, as that's what it needs primarily to keep it alive in the short term. And so what happens is that as that tissue starts deregulating, as that tissue starts creating inflammation uh, and dying, if you, uh, if you don't, it, so what often can happen is that that blockage will often dislodge on its own. And as that blockage dislodges, if there's already been a lot of inflammation and a lot of tissue that's dead, now that you have blood flow into that tissue, it can create a secondary injury. Now, and actually it could be more, it could be worse than the first injury that actually happened. And so the key is that a hyperbaric chamber and a hyperbaric environment is gonna prevent a lot more of that tissue from dying and a lot more of that tissue from creating inflammation and causing these these like sort of cytokine cascades, cytokine storms, if you want to call them that. I know that's been called used differently recently, but cytokines cascades where all this inflammation happens and then all this swelling happens and the, the blood vessels start dying and everything starts dying. So you can mitigate that by getting into a hyperbaric chamber. Um, and so that's, it's preventing something called reperfusion injury. But on top of, of that, Matt, what's important to realize is that if you have dead tissue, that tissue is not likely going to come back. But what happens, the way I like to think about this is if, if you throw a rock into a still lake and there's no ripples or anything before you throw it in, so you throw a rock in, there's a direct impact of that rock, but then around that rock are the ripples, okay? Anytime you have an, a, a, a dead tissue area, it doesn't matter where it is, whether it's the brain, your toe, there's going to be ripples around that dead tissue. There's going to be and that ripple area is the area of tissue that's at risk for dying, but it's not dead because there's still enough blood flow getting to that area to maintain some physiologic function. It may not be working at maximal capacity, but it's not dead and has the potential to regenerate. And that's really where hyperbaric therapy can work in patients that have had long-term injuries, that have had tissue that's dead, for example, but they have a lot of surrounding tissue. And comparison-wise, the direct impact compared to the ripples, the ripple, ripples are much larger as far as what's at risk there, but also what potentially can regenerate and heal itself. And we have studies now, we have like brains that looked, uh, we've looked at brains with functional imaging, imaging looking, looking at blood flow and metabolic activity. And you can see how, like if somebody's had a stroke, for example, the, the tissue where the, the tissue is dead is blue. There's no blood flow there. But then around that, you have a gradation of injury of various 
types of various severities. And then in a hyperbaric chamber, we can regenerate a lot of that tissue around the dead tissue. And that's going to prevent more of the tissue that was around the dead tissue from dying as well because of the lack of blood supply, the lack of the ability to regenerate itself with injuries or infections, trauma, inflammation, things like that. Interesting. So, so basically we could bring back dying tissue, but not necessarily dead tissue. <laughs> right. Exactly. If it's dead, it's dead. Is what, it's what it comes down to. Now, can you, if it's in the brain, for example, can you create things like neuroplasticity? So you can basically, uh, you can, even though you have some area that's dead, you can repurpose other neurons to create the function back that you lost. And this happens in patients. And I've seen this over the years, especially if it's relatively early after the injury, you can learn how to walk again. You can learn how to speak again. You can learn how to wipe your butt again. That's important, right? So you can do these things. You can repurpose neurons to do them. But the sooner the better is what it comes down to. I'm glad I'm starting early. I'm 33. Yeah. <laughs> well, the benefits, they run the gamut, right? It's not just in patients that have severe conditions. It's in people that want to optimize their cellular biology, right? They want to have more of that oxygen getting to their tissues, their mitochondria being more efficient, more mitochondria per cell. And they want to keep inflammation down. They want those stem cells to be released and maintain that, that tissue. And so depending on the type of chamber and the type of indication, we can get systemic benefits of, in, of endurance, increasing things like VO2 max, for example. We can get your erectile function to come back online in the hyperbaric chambers. And we can do that by creating new blood flow, new blood vessels in tissues that have degenerated over time. The heart, the genitals, the brain, the fingers, the toes, and everything in between, because we're creating the stimulus for new stem cells to be released. And stem cells can get, uh, once they're released, they can go anywhere that they're needed to create new tissue. And you get these new stem cells that are released, new blood vessels that are being formed. You recreate or regenerate scaffolding, maintain scaffolding if it's not something that needs to be regenerated or recreated. And so that's why I work with athletes. I work with Silicon Valley entrepreneurs here in the, in, in the Bay Area where I live. I work with patients with Lyme and chronic infections and patients with dementia of all types and optimal performers, biohackers, sun worshipers, psychedelic users. It doesn't matter. I, use, I mean, because there's always a way to use hyperbaric therapy as this sort of anchoring technology because it is the breath of life, man. This is getting into a chamber that's going to be giving you more oxygen. It's always just understanding how best to use it for you. That's awesome. Yeah, I grew up uh, wearing glasses, and then I eventually got contact lenses. And mm -hmm. I remember at the end of the day, my eye was so dry, and I would it would almost give me a headache, and it was just my eyes were like sore. And so I eventually got like fourth generation, or fifth generation LASIK eye surgery, and still good to this day. But since then, I've learned that the cornea uh, uses diffusion, like it's direct oxygen. So when we put like a piece of plastic, like a contact lens over mm -hmm. our eye, it's like suffocating. <laughs> and I did, mm -hmm. I did 23 and me, and I guess I have the gene variant or whatever for age related macular degeneration. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm on my light stuff and blue blocking, and I'm just kind of aware of artificial light a little more, but mm -hmm. I would imagine that for any kind of eye condition, right? This type of therapy is tremendous. It can be the only one that we don't recommend is cataracts because mm -hmm. cataracts do grow faster in high oxygen conditions. But other than cataracts, the other eye conditions that you've described, macular degeneration, there's been some data to show that hyperbaric therapy can help. There's also some data in glaucoma, for example, that is it actually decreases swelling of the eyeball, which is what happens in glaucoma. Now, it's not something that happens forever. Like, so if you leave the chamber, for the swelling does come back eventually. But there may be ways to maintain that eye pressure at lower levels using hyperbaric therapy over the long term, over like a maintenance kind of thing. Although we don't know for sure, because nobody's done those studies yet. Mm -hmm. Eye infections uh, are another one, for example, that we use hyperbaric therapy a lot for as well. Because we can combine, so you have all this oxygen in circulation. There's some bugs that do not like high oxygen conditions. A lot of those bugs actually reside in our, like, our face and our mouth, the anaerobic bugs, the bugs that, that do not like high oxygen conditions. And so it's used in combination with those kinds of bugs uh, and antibiotics, for example, that are, that are directed against those bugs, uh, hyperbaric therapy in combination to help heal from those kinds of things. So 
flesh-eating bacteria, necrotizing fasciitis, the one I was alluding to before when I was in hospital and, and looking and seeing people with, with these severe infections. A lot of times these patients need their limbs amputated, but getting in hyperbaric environments can potentially help them and prevent that from happening because it actually kills those bugs and it, it helps with the whole toxicity that's happening as a result. And as a result of uh, this, this high oxygen stimulus, it's also killing bugs in like your, in your small and large intestines, especially those that do not like high oxygen environments. And so there has been some data in like in small intestine bacterial overgrowth, for example, in SIBO in helping in that capacity as well. Although it, not a huge amount of data, but something that I've used in the past for patients with SIBO and also in patients that have inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is it helps with stem cell release around the colon. And we think some of these patients, not all of them, probably have low-grade infections that are not being addressed. And so as a result, we use hyperbaric therapy in combination with other stuff, integrative approaches. Of course, it's not just about getting in the chamber, but I've seen some, some significant benefits as a result. That's awesome. And also, uh, like mold, bacteria, and viruses, it'll also touch those, right? Yeah, anything that does not like high oxygen environments. So there's definitely most of the molds, most of the fungus, fungi, fungi, do not like high oxygen environments. So I've done a lot of mold protocols over the years to help people detox from mold. It's not typically just getting in the chamber. It's usually mold-directed therapies, antioxidant support, you know, just cleaning up the diet, all those kinds of things. And uh, I like to say that I'm a conductor, really, Matt. I have a hyperbaric chamber and I use them, uh, but I also am very emphatic that if somebody comes in to my office or calls me because I do worldwide hyperbaric consultation and education and things, as you know, and they say, I want to use the chamber for mold, I'd be like, okay, we can use it as a synergistic treatment to help you with your mold toxicity, but what are you doing to support your detox pathways? What are you doing to support your ability to get rid of this mold in the first place? And oftentimes I'll work with experts in like mold, uh, experts in functional medicine or whatever to help with uh, that more holistic approach there so that because I've, I've gotten into trouble in the past if I haven't done that. And that was early in my career when I didn't know that if I didn't support somebody that they wouldn't be able to come back the next day because they felt, they felt so toxic, for example, from their, their treatment. So you know, using things like the infrared sauna, which I know you have, and using things like cold thermogenesis and, 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 and even things like rectal ozone can be helpful. Or I've even had people that are really toxic do things like uh, colon hydrotherapy, for example. So there are ways to use all these things, depending on how, how somebody is sort of at baseline and kind of where we want to get them if we have time before they get into the chamber. Now, if we don't, like I said, throw the educational shit at the wall strategy. But in general, if people come in with like longstanding exposures, unlike most people in my field, I don't immediately put them in the hyperbaric chamber if I can avoid it. I often say, let's, let's stop here. Let's figure out what we can do to optimize you first and then decide whether... And if uh, hyperbaric therapy is something that's appropriate for you. That's awesome. That's a really balanced approach. And so for someone like me, that's like a biohacker, like doesn't have a chronic debilitating condition that they're experiencing. Do you think it's mm -hmm. something okay to generally just jump right in? I mean, there's always individuality, but. <laughs> I would say in essence, the answer is yes. Uh, I would, of course, it just depends on what your goals are. If you have goals to like optimize systemic performance, like you want, you want to think of one thing. If you're just looking to recover from a workout, that's another thing. If you're looking for jet lag, that's another protocol. Like there's all these various protocols that I use in my practice that help you, the user of the, te the technology, understand how you can best integrate it with the rest of the things that you're doing and the goals that you have. Hyperbaric therapy is great for jet lag, for example, because when you're in a, in a, in a airplane, you're in the opposite of a hyperbaric chamber. You're in a hypo, H-Y-P-O, baric chamber. You're pressurized to be at about 8,000 feet above sea level. So you have less oxygen in the air that you're breathing when you're on an airplane. You guys remember those? We used to fly on them before the pandemic. That's right. So some of us still go every once in a while. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so when you're on a plane, and most of us will be on a plane sometime soon, again, uh, you will be at a low oxygen environment. And that, that's one of the reasons why you have jet lag. That's one of the reasons why you feel more fatigue. You feel uh, you have a higher risk of getting infections when you, uh, when you get to your destination, wherever that might be. So getting into a hyper oxygenated environment can be very helpful for you as soon as you get to your location, whether that's home or another locale, to get oxygen infusion and get yourself 
working. Because what happens when you have less oxygen in circulation, Matt? You're going to get less tissue diffusion of oxygen. So less of your cells are going to be getting the amount of oxygen that they, think that they need to maintain their optimized physiologic function. So the, the, the faster you can get yourself in a higher oxygen condition or environment, the, the quicker that jet lag and the, the less risk of infection you likely are going to have, for example. That makes sense. So I have to get all my friends to get one. So when I go to see them, I can use theirs. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Friends and <laughs> friends in places where they have hyperbaric chambers close by. <laughs> awesome. Um, do you want to jump into some, some questions that people sent in? Sure. I mean, I guess the one thing I would say before that is it's really important as we're talking about all of this, Matt, is I know that not everybody gets the chance to get into a hyperbaric environment, right. that a lot of the things that you can do to optimize your ability to create energy most efficiently don't require you to go into an, a hyperbaric chamber. And in fact, for most patients, uh, clients or whatever that come see me or that I talk to, they don't have an acute injury. I focus on all the foundational stuff first, if possible. And that's making sure that they have optimized levels of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and cofactors, that their guts aren't toxic, that they have practitioners and specialists that can help them along the way, depending on what their condition is. Like if it's a traumatic brain injury, maybe they need neurofeedback, for example, or cranial sacral therapy from a chiropractor or something like that. Or, or if it's somebody that has Lyme, they're, they're, they're working with a Lyme literate doctor at the same time, and they're working on detox stuff, et cetera. So, but again, all, all that stuff's important, even if you're not getting into a chamber. Like how are you optimizing the oxygen getting to your tissue? Like how are you harnessing the power of that oxygen to work as well as it can when it gets there? And then how are you detoxing as well as you can from, the, uh, from this extra energy that you're making when you're getting more oxygen to your tissue? That's how I think about it for everybody. And that's, I think that's important. So, and there's ways to optimize all those steps, no matter if you get into a chamber or not. I love that. That's, that's an awesome approach. And yeah, even though I sell supplements, I always tell people like, you know, you can't be eating McDonald's or fast food every day. Like you have to, you know, animal nutrition, you know, retinol, copper, you know, real yeah, liver sense, is better. Yeah. Than yeah. yeah. yeah my, my sense always, Matt, is just, and what I do in my practice, it's something called health optimization medicine is I measure stuff and then I give people what they need, not what they don't need. And that's, that's how I see it. And if they need something, we give it. If we don't, we don't give it. If somebody's toxic, we try to mitigate the toxicity. And then that's my approach. Now, not everybody can get everything measured. And I understand that it, it can be expensive, but like a general idea of understanding, like, like your protocols, for example, are very reasonable for people to use as sort of like the, their sort of like their anchor as they're looking at ways to further optimize their abilities to make energy, for example. For me, it's about knowing that if you can't make energy effectively, why am I even going to put you in a chamber? Because you're not going to benefit from it. In fact, you can get worse. And so, of course, that's if I need to put somebody in the chamber, I'll do my best to support them. But if I don't need to, I won't unless I at least they're approaching some of these things first. Now, for people that are very healthy overall, we don't necessarily have to do a lot of these things. But in, in essence, I still recommend it, even if people think they're healthy, right? It's like there's lots of definitions of health and, and of course, right, the, the absence of disease or that's one, of course. But just because you're not sick doesn't mean you're well. It just means you're not sick. So that's what one of my colleagues, his name's Dr. Ted, likes to say. The, and so that's what I like to always come back to. Even if you think you're like, you're like this awesome biohacker who never gets sick, I bet you there's still stuff you can do if you measure stuff and look at things at that level. Yeah, there's a... Uh, one of my favorite memes is uh, it says not all diseases look like this, and it's like a stick figure in a wheelchair. It says some look like right. this, and it's like the stereotypical bathroom stick figure. You know, <laughs> it's a normal person. So, yeah, it's you know. it's a really good it's a really good thing to remind people. Like you have people walking around like you and I, Matt, that look fine but are absolutely shattered inside, and it's it's a really it's a tough. It's so hard because people are getting sicker and sicker, younger and younger. You know, it used to be that you can be about, for men, it was about eight, about 30, 35 years of age. Like it was very difficult to get sick. You were very resilient. And then women, you know, 25 to 35, maybe a little bit younger uh, for women, like they're more optimized. But now all those things are just shifting down. I'm getting patients and clients that are much younger 
just because of the toxicity in our environment and the foods that we eat and and uh, everything that you've you've described before. I'm, I'm sure on other on other podcasts, it's just the toxicity load is so much higher now that we really do need to address these things earlier and earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you use red light therapy? Like I've been into like triple LT, low level laser therapy mm -hmm. for years and. Uh, some people say it only makes like one or two percent difference. I think it's bigger than that, personally. <laughs> I see it as a way to target my hyperbaric therapy because if you are using low-level light therapy, what you're doing is creating uh, nitric oxide, right? Nitric oxide synthase, synthase, which is creating more of the blood vascular dilation, and it's also working on the cytochromes of the mitochondria, as you know, to make more energy. So if you're dilating blood vessels and you're making more energy, and then you suddenly give that tissue more oxygen, what is going to happen? That It's an oxygen debt in that tissue because you've created this dilation of blood vessels. Now this area of your body is more hungry for oxygen to make more energy. So if you can give that oxygen to those tissues, you can create the stimulus to enhance the ability to make more energy and to heal those tissues. So we call it targeted HBOT. And so you can use, you can use low level light therapy before, during, or after to help with that process and creating the ability to enhance the flow of oxygen to that tissue to create more energy, create more healing, et cetera. So absolutely, 100%, I'm, I'm on the triple LT train myself. That's awesome. Yeah, I have to find my V-Lite headset, but I have so much hair, I'm just, I don't even know if it goes through, but I guess. The nasal applicator, at least. Yep, for sure. Because that'll yeah. shoot right up your nose. And that's, that's something that we have used in, in combination for some patients with, with, uh, with dementia and traumatic brain injury, for example. Uh, using the, the, the V-Light uh, with the nasal applicator especially seems to be pretty helpful. And of course, mm -hmm. other things as well, but uh, that's something that we've used some success. Any other things you've synergized? Because I've used like my new calm in there and neurofeedback, mm -hmm. neurooptimal, and I'm trying to find like the best stack because you can't have things plugged in unless you bring a little generator in there, right? <laughs> right. right? It depends on the chamber, right? So like in the mild chambers that go to 1.3 atmospheres that you can have for your home, these are chambers where you can bring in small amounts of electronics with you. You can't bring in generators, please don't do that. But, um, <laughs> but you can bring in things like, you know, your phone, your iPad, your computer, like things like portable devices, like low level light therapy devices, portable um, additional devices like neurofeedback, like you said, like neurooptimal is one of them. Um, I like a couple other things. I, I like to try to stay as low tech as I can for people because you know, more devices is more devices, of course. But, um, but some of the other ones I like from a device perspective, uh, pulse electromagnetic field technology. So uh, PEMP technology is a pretty good one. Um, what else do I use? I use, I mean, I, that's, that one, low level light therapy and neurofeedback are the main ones that I use. Now there's some people that are doing like electric stim and things. I don't do a lot of this, but I have a couple of my athletes that do electric stim inside of the chamber. So they'll use electric stim on various muscle groups and, and, and other uh, areas of the body that are tight, tense to create that oxygen debt, as I was describing it, so that you get more oxygen that goes to that tissue and, and helps it heal. Um, those are the main ones uh, that we use. I mean, meditation is great in the chamber, whether you use a technology or not. When you're high, more high, highly oxygenated, you're getting more oxygen to your brain and your meditations seem to be more, just more profound in general. So some people tell me they get psychedelic in their chambers just with just getting more oxygen. So, um, but at the deeper pressures with the medical grade units, you can't bring anything in there with you most of the time because it's gonna be a higher risk for things like fire and, and, and because the more pressure, the more oxygen, the, there's a higher fire risk. That's easily mitigated, but the one way to mitigate that is not bringing any electronics in there, for example. That's interesting because that's the, like I, we were talking about before I started recording, like I breathe hydrogen and mm -hmm. I guess if you go above 7%, it could be flammable. So same thing with oxygen. Right? <laughs> Indeed. Yes. These noble gases. Yes. But um, the hydrogen is an interesting one. You know, we, I've been learning more about it and I think that the gas makes sense to me, how it can potentially work uh, as a gaseous form. The liquid form is still it's still, it must be a signaling molecule, molecule somehow. I don't quite understand how it works outside of being a gas, but yes, it's similar to hydrogen in its flammability. I think it was my third or fourth session. Um, I got a, a headache after my, my third or fourth hyperbaric session. And mm -hmm. uh, I used one of those hydrogen tablets and, you know, let it dissolve. And then I drank the hydrogen gas I think It's like seven or eight parts per million. 
and it seemed to help my headache. I mean, it was just kind of a logical idea I had like, oh, something probably opened up. I don't know if it was angiogenesis or something. Possible. But... Well, what had probably happened, I mean, this is just me completely off the cuff here. I don't really know. Um, hydrogen is really important to creating the, the differential of electric potential in the mitochondria, right? Like if you can somehow take hydrogen and create more of that potential, you are going to allow yourself to make more flow of electrons through your electron transport chain and make, and if there's more oxygen available, making more energy. So it could have been, again, off the cuff here, we gave you more oxygen, your body wanted to make more energy, but maybe it couldn't in a particular area for some reason. And as a result of creating the ability to have more of the hydrogen ions and that electric potential across the membrane of the mitochondria, that was your way of being able to use that oxygen more effectively. So the oxygen was there as the final electron acceptor, but you didn't have enough of that gradient in those particular cells to continue to have that, that, that potential. Because you need those hydrogen ions pumped one side of the membrane, and then they come through with the ATP synthase, the, the, the rotor that makes the, the ATP as you are creating the ability to, to have those electrons pass through, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's uh, that could have been what happened, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Again, off the cuff, I don't know. Oh. Or there's somehow some signaling molecules that create the stimulus for making more hydrogen ions pumped in, rather than it being the hydrogen ions you took directly from the water itself, I don't know. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and I'm doing so much stuff at once, like I'm doing neurofeedback, so who knows? How much neurogenesis right. I have going on that maybe it was Classic just right. <laughs> but yeah, overall, um, I've been on the the Henshaw hyperbaric chamber for a month now, and I'm loving it. I average an hour a night, and I think I've only taken one day off. And uh, I think you recommend taking one day off a, a week, right? If you have your own, yeah, one day to two days off a week. You typically, if you have it at your house. Now, again, it depends on what your goals are. There are like optimal protocols. And then there are goals that are like, for like shorter term kinds of things, like I was discussing before. It depends on what you want to use the chamber for. But yes, in general, for longer protocols, we're doing it five to six days a week, 60 to 90 minutes in the chamber, one to two days off per week. Yes. And uh, one question that came up earlier is, I think you mentioned three sessions, you see the antioxidant rise that mm -hmm. equals the oxidant increase. Um, is that like the minimum? Like, one session, like you mentioned at the start of the show, you could get results from acute stuff. But um, for someone that just wants to try, like, would you say three days, like generally the minimum block you want to do, ideally a month? Yeah, yeah. For most, I mean, again, it depends on the indication and what you're looking to get out of being in the chamber. But for most people, except if you just got plastic surgery and you're just trying to get more oxygen in there to heal up your nose job, for most people, I do recommend at least three sessions yeah, because that's when you have the ability to create the antioxidant response and then things kind of balance themselves out. Now, if patients have, there's a lot of caveats to that. There's other people that come in that they're coming in for cancer related synergy. That's different. We don't want that antioxidant response. We want to maintain that oxidant response while you're being, while you're potentially stressing the tumors in other ways. And so again, it, that's why it's hard to make these sort of like large pronouncements with protocols. And that's what, uh, that's the company that I've been developing called HBOT Plus, which is developing protocols and developing new technology to make them easier for people to use in the home. Uh, and also at, even for clinics as well, if they want to get in the action at some point when we get protocols for the deeper chambers. But right now, my protocols have been focused on the milder chambers and for more wellness related protocols. And then I do a lot of consulting and education and virtual stuff with clients across the world to help personalize that a little bit more, depending on what their what their needs are. But the key for me is trying to educate people and understanding like the very uh, the very goals they have align with how you're going to use the chamber. And if there are very acute goals, very short term goals, then less treatment is needed. If there are longer term goals, if they want to see sustainable stuff for a long period of time whatever it might be, it's going to take a longer period of time in the chamber. And then maybe maintenance afterwards at a, at a less regular clip. So for example, instead of five or six days a week, maybe two to three days a week kind of thing. Oh, that's awesome. 
Okay. And so for me, like for anti-aging purposes, after I do my month, I think I've done two to three days a week, or could I, should I, could I continue for anti-aging doing it? You know, uh, four or five. So what I would say is if you have the time, I would do probably around 40 with the weekends off or one day off. And then after 40, then I would start going to two, three times a week and trying to use those two to three times a week strategically in the sense of like, are you going to have a big workout today? Are you going to be doing something with your tractor on your ranch, chopping wood or whatever? And I know you got lots of sort of manly things that you do on your, <laughs> on your land. <laughs> really work out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's great. And if you're going to have a big day of doing those things, using the chamber afterwards will help you recover faster because you've created the inflammation because of the workout. And that's what workouts do. That's what they're supposed to do. But after about an hour or so, you want to help the body detox and recover so that you're not sore the next day. And hyperbaric therapy can help you with that, for example. This is going to help bring blood to the tissue, but it's also at the same time going to bring the waste products out of the tissue into your lymphatics and help you pump it out and detox it, get it to the liver, et cetera. That's awesome. That, the, the epigenetic changes, I mean, that and the angiogenesis, the creation of new blood vessels, seems to be, to me, like really important. Uh, or at least yeah. selling points for me. <laughs> so epigenetics is this basically the idea that this stimulus, this particular stimulus being a hyperbaric stimulus, but any stimulus creates a change in how your DNA is expressing and suppressing various genes. And these are environmental stimuli, okay? These are things that are coming outside of your, your biology, coming outside the system. And so lots of things do it. Sunlight does it. Bacteria, fungus, virus, do it. Exposure to EMFs may do it, et cetera. And so a protocol of hyperbaric therapy will help you express various genes that are responsible for growth and decreasing inflammation. And that includes new blood vessels. Stem cells are released immediately and they continue to be released throughout your whole hyperbaric experience. And those stem cells then can hone to areas where there's inflammation, where there's infection, where there's degeneration to help heal those tissues. Because hyperbaric therapy is creating all the cells because of those stem cells that can make those new tissues, new neurons, new supporting neurons like glial cells, new connective tissue, new blood vessels, new heart cells, new, new, you know, new cells anywhere really can be made. New cartilage cells, for example, they can all be made inside of a hyperbaric environment. So yes, the, the key of the, the sort of longe longevity benefits are related to the epigenetic changes and how it revitalizes the body, regenerates the body, and does that in a synergistic way with a lot of other types of approaches that are also looking to optimize our physiology. That's awesome. Um, on Facebook, I posted like a Excel spreadsheet of all the compiled uh, light therapy studies do you know if there's anything like that for hyperbaric uh, therapy, like all the, the clinical studies, or would you, would you just recommend going to PubMed and do HBOT or something? <laughs> so there's a couple places. For the, the medical indications of hyperbaric therapy, and there's, as I mentioned, 14, and 14 that are approved, and also for the medical grade chambers, there's probably another 40 or so that has some pretty great data that, uh, that's been collated in a website that I helped create uh, not too long ago. It's run by a facility out in New York. It's called Hyperbaric Medical Solutions. And they're on Instagram, Hyperbaric Medical Solutions. But if you go to their website, it's hyperbaricmedicalsolutions.com or hmshbot.com. And you go to their indications page, all those indications there for the medical grade chambers, I helped collate all that data on all the research a couple of years ago, and we've been updating it since then. So that's a great place to learn more about the medical indications for hyperbaric therapy and some of the research that's been done. There's also, for the mild chambers, there's a, a website that's run by a colleague of mine called hyperbaricexperts.com, and that's where a lot of the, the mild chamber data has, uh, has been collated and has been kind of kept there. So that's where I typically recommend people to go. Of course, you can go to PubMed as well, uh, but this is probably easier than going to PubMed itself, unless you love you. PubMed. <laughs> awesome. Um, we had a few people ask about... Yeah. Um, COVID, COVID, and, uh, and and hyperbaric therapy for sure. for the latest latest virus stuff. <laughs> I'm happy to answer that question. Thank you for asking. So, 
hyperbaric therapy, one of the things it does, Matt, like we talked about, it gives you 1,200% more oxygen in circulation. And as a result of that, there has been use of hyperbaric therapy in patients with severe COVID infections that are, that are either about to go on ventilators or to try to, or people that are, or, or patients that are on ventilators and trying to get them off. And there has been significant excitement in the hyperbaric community because it seems to help. And the reason for that is that we're getting more oxygen to that tissue that's being starved of oxygen. And in fact, we think the reason why people that are having these sort of long COVID symptoms, patients that have had COVID but are not fully recovering, one of the reasons is because of severe hypoxia or low oxygen state during the actual infection. Another reason probably is that the immune system is being revved up as a result of those low oxygen states as well. And so we think that hyperbaric ther therapy can help in the sort of long COVID process as well. But it's been well studied, pretty well studied in the acute side across the world as something that could prevent patients from going on ventilators and potentially helping people get off ventilators if they're on them. The challenge though, is that hyperbaric therapy is not available at every hospital and getting a patient that has COVID inside a hyperbaric chamber is not easy to pull off either, especially if they're very sick, if they are, they're on lots of medications and IVs and, and things like that. But what we're going to be seeing more of, I think, because now they have other treatments for COVID and hyperbaric therapy is probably not going to be used very much in the acute side because of lack of availability and because it's not a patented technology, is that there's no money behind it. There's no pharmaceutical that's going to be making a lot of money if people get into a hyperbaric chamber. Um, but on the post-COVID or the long COVID side of things, um, I do potentially, at least anecdotally so far, we some, had some significant benefit with patients, especially with people that have had more of the breathlessness and chest pain and, and related sort of pulmonary symptoms related to their infections. And this is all very unproven. It's all investigational. I can't say, go ahead and do it. It's going to help you. I don't know. But I do know that there are facilities around the country. And there's actually one facility in Florida that I think is going to get some funding to do some research, which is great, to look at this more, uh, more formally. But I do feel that if you can hyperoxygenate the system in the short term, it can prevent potentially patients needing to be, to be intubated and being on ventilators. Obviously, we know from early experience with this illness, this virus, that if you went on a ventilator, you had like an 80% chance of dying. So staying off a ventilator is, is a good idea as, as much as you can <laughs> for any reason, <laughs> really, um, except if you need to protect your airway for like a trauma. But anyway, for the most part, you don't want to be on a ventilator. But from the long COVID or the, the, the sort of indolent long-term symptoms, symptoms that people are having, I think at least partially this is related to low oxygen states during the acute infection. And then the system gets deregulated and you have these cytokines and inflammatory things that are not getting better. And then the immune system gets, gets all screwed up and then the immune system's hyper responsive. And then I think a lot of this can be solved, I think, with getting, getting more oxygen and, and hyper oxygenating the system. But the time, time will tell. You know, we're, right now, we're really at the beginning of understanding this. Wow, that's super fascinating. Um... This was a good one. How does uh, hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy compare to ozone therapy? Uh, similarity, similarities and differences. Um, mm -hmm. I'd imagine that hyperbaric is safer. I don't know. <laughs> it depends on how you're doing your ozone, I guess. But I'm not an ozone expert, but I, I do think that ozone is really can be actually a pretty fantastic tool for inflammation. Uh, and it can probably be a pretty good uh, tool for immune system function. So I'm actually pretty intrigued by ozone for COVID. And I have been since the beginning of the pandemic. And there have been some studies outside the US, but nothing in the United States because ozone is the snake oil around here. But I do think that there's benefit. I don't see it as a systemic epigenetic benefit like hyperbaric therapy in the sense of creating the stimulus to make these new blood vessels and decreasing inflammation and repopulate these stem cells in areas uh, of the body that we want. Can it help with infection ozone? I absolutely think it can. Can it help with inflammation? I think it can help with that. And it can it help with uh, immune system function. I think it probably can help with those three things. Now, I'm not an ozone doctor. If you did, they'd probably tell you that I was wrong and I can do all of these things. But the way I've seen it work best in my practice with my patients is in those ways. And that I use hyperbaric therapy as the more systemic stimuli or stimulus 
to create that epigenetic shift. And then get, getting more oxygen to tissue more acutely, as we discussed, is a fantastic way to help that tissue stay online. And ozone doesn't have the same ability to create more energy at the cellular level because it's O3. So it's more of an oxidative molecule. It's not an energy inducing molecule as much as, as hyperbaric oxygen is, if that makes sense. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I haven't dove into it yet. I know a lot of people go wild for ozone IVs and rectal insufflation. And I yeah. just have a water o ozonator, but one of the more legitimate ones, like half, half of a grand, um, uses Corona discharge, but I mostly use that for cleaning. So, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, that's good for it's good for cleaning, uh, and also I mean, rectal insufflation of ozone. I've used it with lots of patients with good effect to help with detoxification, especially if they have a lot of GI related issues. If they have leaky gut, if they have bacterial overgrowth, if they have parasites or or, or pathogenic bacteria, or if they are trying to heal from an infection that's systemic and they're having lots of GI issues, you, you certainly don't want to be constipated if you're going through, like, well, you don't want to be constipated in general, but you definitely don't want to be constipated if you're getting treated for an infection, for inflammation, for you know, toxicity overload, for heavy metal overload, or things like that, because you're crapping all that stuff out. So you want to make sure that you're crapping that stuff out well. And, uh, and helping, one of the ways I've seen uh, beneficial is using rectal insufflation with ozone. That's awesome. And you're a methylene blue guy, too. I actually use... Uh, I think the product, the transcriptions that you work with, and I do. Uh, there, yeah. There's been some interest. I mean, it was a malaria drug first, right? So there's some interesting yeah. antiviral. Yeah, I've been I've been starting to combine methylene blue more with the hyperbaric work that I do. The methylene blue, yeah, transcriptions. I'm the, the chief operating officer of that company as well here in the U.S. and actually globally as we continue to spread. But uh, the methylene blue product that we have is a special one because methylene blue is sort of the runt of the litter on some level because it's been around too long for people to care about it. It was the first drug that was registered with the FDA back in the 1850s, I think, or 1890s, I'm forgetting. I think the 1890s. And it was initially a textile and then they realized that it treated malaria. And because it has significant potential as a, an electron cycler, it can be both an oxidant, an oxidant and an antioxidant, depending on dosing and depending on loca location. So before antibiotics were around, they used to use methylene blue as a way to treat uh, bacterial infections, urinary tract infections, fungal infections, malaria. And it was actually very famous. I forget the song, but like the Navy pilots during World War II had a song about methylene blue turning their piss blue while they were like in the South Pacific, not the South Pacific. Yeah, the South Pacific, like some of the like like on the on the on the eastern front of the war, using it uh, there for the Pacific front. Uh, it was actually quite common for things like trench foot and, and other things like that they were getting in some of these islands. So um, yeah, methylene blue was around in those capacities, but over the, the, the 20th century, it was realized that it was actually something that could be used uh, for a lot of its other properties as it relates to making energy more effectively at the cellular level. And in fact, it works, I think, seven or eight distinct ways uh, in, in, in how it can make you, allow you to make more energy effectively. It changes the conformation of hemoglobin to actually allow you to, to, to drop more oxygen off your hemoglobin into your cells to make more energy. It also works by making the electron transfer chain more efficient. It works, it actually can work just like oxygen and the electrons that are being transposed through the electron transfer chain can drop themselves on methylene blue instead of oxygen if needed and allow that ATP to continue to form. And it, it works in these various ways. And so there, there have been studies on memory, on focus, on cognition. And so I've been thinking about how to use methylene blue, the transcriptions brand methylene blue, that's pharmaceutical grade and, and purity tested because it's really hard to find really good sources of this, as you know, Matt, because methylene blue is also used in fish tanks to clean them because of the fungal infections inside of fish tanks. Please don't use fish tank methylene blue. It's, it, the purities, impurities are like heavy metals, man, like mercury and cadmium and nickel and, and bad stuff. So I use the pharmaceutical grade meth methylene blue, just blue trochies. It's called a trochee because it's something that dissolves in your mouth. And I use the, I'm using them more for my brain injured patients, for patients with, with cognitive issues and having significant benefit to using it. 
And what's great about it is it's something you can use daily, uh, even if you don't have a hyperbaric chamber, to help with oxygen uh, utilization, help with energy production at the cellular level. And there is some indication that combining it with things like sunlight, for example, may enhance the effect of its ability to create more energy at the cellular level, and also uh, its antiviral and antifungal capacity as well. Although that's probably a little bit of a higher dose than we're putting in the trochee. All our claims for on that product, Just Blue, is nootropic formula, of course. But what is nootropic doing? It's enhancing the ability to make more energy at the cellular level in your brain so you can think faster, think quicker, more, more verbal, verbal fluency, which I'm not having at the moment. But you know what I mean. So. <laughs> Did you take yours today? I'm still blue for mine. <laughs> but I was actually, depends on the day. Today I had a little bit of nicotine earlier for verbal fluidity. And then sometime usually around two or three o'clock in the afternoon is when I would take my methylene blue trochee. So I haven't taken it yet. No, I haven't. <laughs> yeah. Some days I kind of forget, but I like the just blue versus the blue canatine. Uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of like a speed ball, which I think for me is if I'm traveling, I'm going to go for the blue canatine, but if I'm home, sure. I like the just, and even if I drive, cause it's pretty far into town. So I'll do it for, you know, if I'm going to be driving for more than an hour in a day and I really feel it, I just do like, four milligrams, like one fourth of a troke okay. trokey. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. It's, it's really fun. And, uh, some people like my, I gave it to my neighbor and he's like, the taste is so bad. So I'm trying to find like a, uh, a, a hack or something like maybe drink orange juice right after or before or something. Uh, cause you have yeah, like there bitter are a block. Foods. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there are a couple of foods. I was just reading about one that changes all your like bitterness into sweet. I'll have to send it to you. I don't remember, but you're right. It's, it is a challenge for some people because it's not, we made it taste as good as it could for methylene blue because methylene blue is quite bitter. But in general, Matt, you know, for your audience, and I don't recommend this for many, is that if you do have a hard time with the, the trochee and dissolving here, you can swallow it and that will help. Though it won't be as focused as far as the absorption in your brain because the, the buccal absorption in your mouth, the gums and that sort of the, the vascular plexus, the vascular network or matrix around there is going to drain. It all drains from the brain. So you're going to get more of the methylene blue up there. That's why we like it in the mouth. You can swallow it. And if you do swallow it, it's like taking a supplement or anything like that. It has to go through first pass of your liver and metabolism, but it still can be very beneficial. And so sometimes I'll take them that way. For example, if I'm on an airplane or something and I don't want to have it in my mouth as I'm on the plane, I'll just, I'll swallow it before I get on the plane and go. So you, you just, one thing you just don't want to do is chew it. You just don't want to chew the thing because that's not, any, it's going to taste terrible. So uh, we've worked on the flavor over the years and blue canatine does taste a little bit better than the pure methylene blue trochee because it doesn't have as much methylene blue in it. But you're right, blue canatine is not for everybody. It's going to give you more of a stimulus. It's going to be more of a, of, a, of a, because it's got caffeine and nicotine in it, it's going to give you more of that stimulant quality. But like you said, some people need just a quarter of the trochee and they're good. Some people need a half. Some people need a full one. If you're like a huge bodybuilder, those dudes sometimes need as many as two to feel the same effect. For whatever reason, they're just highly metabolic, right? Because they have so much muscle tissue for all that, uh, for all that energy to be made. And they need, they, have, they need huge glycogen stores and everything else, as you know. So regardless, for me, Just Blue is usually what I use as well, the, the pure methylene blue trochee. However, if I need a big bump, in my energy, then that's when I use blue canatine. And so we like to think of Just Blue as our health optimization supplement. It's something you can take daily and, and utilize it for the reasons that we mentioned. Blue canatine is more of the one that you can sort of use more targeted, precision dosed. Everything's precision dosed, but like you can precision and say, I'm going to use it now because I have a podcast to record or I have a, a lecture to give or I have a date that I want to you know, to, to have a date tonight and I want to make sure that I'm verbally fluent and I have something to talk about, for example, because my tongue's blue. <laughs> That's awesome. And I love, I just got the shirt too. It says blue me and people laugh at that. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a crowd pleaser having a blue tongue and having a shirt that says blue me. Uh, what are you talking about, Matt? <laughs> I haven't worn it out yet, but uh, I'm in Idaho, so I don't think people would care. But um, no, you're going to see lots of fun things on shirts up there. <laughs> so and lack thereof. Nic right, right. Speaking of nicotine, um, carbon monoxide, 
we were talking about earlier, you brought that up. Mm. And someone asked, does it help secondhand smokers? I personally smoke cigars. I think it has benefit. I mean, I prefer that over taking nicotine personally, but I don't do it every day. Um, but any kind of, you know, whether it's a cannabis smoker <laughs> or a cigar smoker, they could benefit from uh, kind of jumping back to hyperbaric. I mean, I guess methylene blue would help too, right? With oxygen. Yeah. I mean, so what happens when you're smoking a lot is that <clears throat> you're creating like an oxygen dent in your lungs. And so that can cause inflammation over time. And so it's, it would be really important, I think, to deal with inflammation. Even if you're just you know, smoking a cigar or if you're smoking weed, pot, marijuana, whatever you want to call it. Weed makes me sound old. People don't call it weed anymore, do they? Um, the devil's, devil's herb. <laughs> the devil's herb, yeah. So if, I don't like people smoking anything, honestly, Matt, because I don't feel that the lungs were really created for you to have anything in there but, but oxygen, nitrogen, and like some of the other gases. Mostly, what about cheek, cheek smoking, right? Just keep it up. Cheek here. smoking? <laughs> mm -hmm. With cigars, you mean, right? Because yeah. but cigars are all, you're also going to diffuse all those things into your cheek mucosa as well with the smoke. And so I don't usually recommend it, but if you're going to do it, yeah, you can sort of approximate things uh, from like a, an optimization perspective by, by optimizing energy production at the cellular level, methylene blue can help. And also getting to the chamber and getting to the chamber and helping with decreasing inflammation, both in your lungs, your mouth and wherever else, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, I had a friend <clears throat> that moved up here that was a chronic cannabis smoker for, mm -hmm. I forget, 20 years. And now he has... Uh, chronic mucus that like comes up like this extreme phlegm that comes up mm -hmm. like mostly in the morning and then mm -hmm. tapers off. And so mm -hmm. I've been trying to help him with systemic enzyme therapy. And um, yeah, some of these conditions that, you know, are, are super deep, I feel like just take like a combination of things. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, especially something that's been longstanding like that, but getting into a chamber and helping with lung inflammation may help. I mean, I have, we have examples of when there were really the big fires in California, not this year as much, but I, about a year ago, we had a, a number of firefighters and people that were exposed to some of the some of the uh, some of the air that was very uh, caustic because of all the smoke. I do very very well in the hyperbaric environment, and that's because they were helping with lung inflammation as well. So something to consider, along with everything else that you're likely doing with him as well. Awesome, <clears throat> cool, cool. Um, this is a good kind of. Um, as we start to close out here. Um, oh, first, actually, Carbogen. I think we kind of talked to, you uh, alluded to this a little bit earlier with hydrogen, but um, there were a few studies on kind of mixing in. Um, so let me back up here. <laughs> so it's 100% oxygen, but I think when I was speaking with you, <clears throat> like the uh, cannula, I guess mm -hmm. when I put that on my nose, I'm rebreathing mm -hmm. a little bit of my carbon dioxide that I'm exhaling, right? right versus right. in the ambient that I'm getting only oxygen, pretty much. Well, yeah, it depends, like the type of chamber that you're in, right? So if, if you're in a chamber that's giving you 100% oxygen, you're just getting 100% oxygen. But if you're in a chamber that's giving you like oxygen from, an, from, a, from a mask or a nasal cannula, then there, that's going to be a certain percentage oxygen. The rest of that is going to be nitrogen. And then as you're breathing that oxygen, and nitrogen combination, most likely, although if you have like an oxygen concentrate, there'll be a higher amount of oxygen. You're getting, you're breathing out the oxygen, you're going to breathe, you're going to be breathing in some of your CO2 as well. And so you asked me about carbogen and, and CO2 and the idea that if you have more CO2, it's going to create the ability to uh, blood, dilate blood vessels and, and create more of a stimulus to get more oxygen to that area. That is certainly true. I don't, we don't have anything really in, in the hyperbaric research to to kind of parallel this as well. But the idea would be that, at least as I see it, you would be breathing in some carbon dioxide during your procedure of having a mask on your face, breathing oxygen at the same time. Awesome, makes sense. Um, do you have time for two more quick questions here? I think so, yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Awesome. Um, so this is a, a good one. What are natural, uh, or are there any contraindications of HBOT? Uh, people that shouldn't do it. Yeah, so um, contraindications are important. Uh, so if you have an un uh, what's an uncontrolled major major medical issue, like you have if you have a seizures disorder that's not controlled, if you have uh, if you have lung disease where you cannot get enough oxygen from the air that you breathe without extra oxygen, 
you're unlikely to be a good candidate for hyperbaric therapy. If you have a heart that doesn't pump well, you're likely not a good candidate for hyperbaric therapy. If you have an abnormal heart rhythm that's not controlled, you're not a good candidate. If you're severely claustrophobic, that might be an issue too because you're going to be in an enclosed space. If you have a fever, you don't want to go in with a fever or a high temperature because that could put you at risk for having oxygen toxicity in the chamber, which I can, I can tell you about in a minute. Uh, and if you're pregnant, you're not allowed to go into the chamber, although they do have pregnant women go in for carbon monoxide poisoning and the babies are fine. It's just something you're not supposed to do. Uh, those are the major things. So if you have uncontrolled brain disease, lung disease, heart disease, you don't want to get into a chamber for the most part. And we can usually, I can usually screen that out pretty quickly with people. Now, if you have, and there's certain medications that can also be dangerous, um, if they also potentially can cause damage to your lung, brain, or heart. Uh, so that those are things that you need to be aware of, like chemotherapy drugs, for example. Uh, that could be one thing that you have to be considerate of if somebody's getting into the chamber. So I have various screening methods that I use to make sure people are safe, but 95% of the time, 98% of the time, people are safe to get into the chamber without much, much of an issue. And as far as what can happen in the chamber, the major thing is that you have ear pressure in the chamber. Like you feel like you're under, uh, you feel like you're on a plane or feel like you're underwater, or like I'm in a tunnel, for example, and you feel like that pressure change in your ear. If you can't depressurize your ears, you can get damage to your eardrums. Pretty unusual, but it's something that can happen. You can get changes to your vision at deeper pressures so that your vision will actually change for the short term where your, your, your far vision will get worse, but your short vision will get better because the convexity of your eye or your lens changes for the short period of time. But that it goes back to normal. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a propensity of having low blood sugars, the chambers at deeper pressures can decrease your blood sugar. So you, may, you wanna make sure that you eat before, like if you're a diabetic, for example. If you have an, like a seizure disorder, or if you have issues with your brain, like you have a stroke, traumatic brain injury, tumors or whatever, uh, you have a higher risk of having a seizure in the chamber if you have those things, but we can mitigate that very easily uh, without much of an issue most of the time. Those are the major things. That's awesome. And, and yeah, you mentioned say the that, Sorry, sorry I was just going to finish up those. I often say that hyperbaric therapy is safer than taking in like a Tylenol or ibuprofen, but you just have to know what your risks are before you go in and what your goals are going. Because you mentioned a fever creating oxygen toxicity. Yes. Well, what can happen, <clears throat> have you ever heard of like a child going, getting a very, a very high fever and having a seizure? It causes a threshold event in the brain where you have electricity going haywire. And so when electricity goes haywire, you can have a seizure at high fevers. And so hyperbaric therapy also causing potentially, you know, with the oxygen in the circulation in combination, you know, there's a possibility. So is it being, being in a high oxygen environment is going to decrease uh, your seizure threshold a little bit. But if you have another thing that's also going to decrease it in combination, it could you know, give you a seizure. So that's what you don't want. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that, um, I think it happened twice in the last few years where my ears got clogged with wax. I just <laughs> woke up and they were clogged. So I learned to keep that little turkey baster looking thing from the pharmacy around. Yeah. And just, you know, yeah, there's lots of ways to clear them out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just don't recommend Q-tips because people tend to ram them in too far and actually damage their eardrum. Please don't do that. <laughs> right. And don't blow tap water up there too. It's probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll, that'll take, get you off balance very quickly. <laughs> um, so this is a good question. I don't know if you answered it earlier, but natural ways to replicate uh, HBOT. Um, cause I know like Wim Hof breathing, there's like the Butanko method, mm -hmm. um, different breathing methods. Uh, but you kind of educate people about that too, right? I do. I mean, I think there's lots of different breathing practices out there, but in essence, what you're looking to do is shift something called the oxygen dissociation curve. You want more oxygen to be dumped into tissues. And the way you do that is by creating localized environments with breathing to make that happen. That's really what it comes down to. And one of the ways that Wim does it, for example, is the hyperventilation part doesn't do it, but the exercise part does. So as soon as you start doing 30 push-ups without breathing, you're creating an acidotic environment. All that oxygen that you've breathed in it now shoots to your tissues, for example, and that's how it works. So, so just hyperventilating is not going to do it, but various practices like the Butenko and others that are using a combination of things together where there's an exercise component 
that's really where the, 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 the benefit is for more oxygen utilization. Because what it comes down to, Matt, for me, is that if you can't get into the chamber, how are you utilizing oxygen better? That's really what it comes down to. And so you can go to the Dead Sea, the lowest place on Earth where there's more oxygen in the environment. So you can go ahead over to Israel. It's a nice place to go dump in and go get your stuff covered in mud and go in the ocean as well, or go in the Dead Sea. But the pressure itself has more oxygen in it. And so as a result of that, you get higher oxygen levels in your body. But notwithstanding going to Israel, you can do it by trying to optimize your ability to utilize that oxygen as best as you can and harness that oxygen uh, in the sense of making how it makes energy as, fe as effectively as you can as well. And that's the groundwork stuff that, we, that you always talk about, Matt, and I talk about too in our own frameworks of optimizing vitamins, minerals, nutrients, toxicity. And then once you have optimized levels and you've been working on that, you'll be able to utilize any oxygen you get more effectively, is what it comes down to. And so exercise is very helpful as well. That'll also work. And then there's also uh, something called exercise with oxygen therapy, which is kind of interesting where you're breathing extra oxygen in the air that, you, that you're breathing at the same time as you're doing some sort of exercise. And that's very likely helpful as well. Not the same as hyperbaric therapy, although they'll tell you that it is the same, but very, I think very much can be beneficial for people as well. And people are using the opposite stimulus, which is low oxygen when they do exercise. That's also a way to build up some, you know, some mitochondrial reserve, mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, so that's another thing you can think about as well. So the opposite of being in a hyperbaric environment may be helpful too. If you're, if you're healthy enough to do it, just don't do hypoxic training if you're not healthy enough to do it because it can really tax the system. Yeah, I've seen those like uh, uh, Batman type villain masks that people wear yeah. while they exercise. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we have to watch out. We have to watch out for that. Right. Awesome, Scott. Well, yeah, I think this was a great, uh, great overview of, of HBOT. And we got to talk about methylene blue a little bit. And we did. Oh, on that topic, too, I wanted to tell you, like, the intranasal light or even red light therapy plus the, the prescriptions, that would be a good combo, right? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I haven't worked with that combo yet. But a lot of the guys and women are using like the, the light pad, light the light, you know, panels, for example. But yeah, let me know how it goes with the if you have the the, the nasal applicator. I haven't seen anybody doing it yet. And all the combos. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much. So the, what would you say, where would you say people should go like Henshaw hyperbarics? Um, I'll put the links below. But... Yeah. So for my personal, my virtual hyperbaric practice, my integrative practice that I, I consult and educate people around the world uh, at Dr. Scott Scherr, D-R-S-C-O-T-T-S-H-E-R-R on Instagram, and also my website, which is integrativehbot.com. Those are the best places. I'm also on Facebook as well. I'm not as active on Facebook, but I do post there sometimes. And you can make a, a time to consult with me and we can chat about personal, uh, personal plans and protocols and goals and things like that. I also, uh, you know, the chamber that you have is from Henshaw, Henshaw Hyperbarics. And then I have my company called HBOT Plus. It's hbot.plus is the website. That company is making hyperbaric therapy better, faster, and safer with new technology, like a new phone, a new phone application that you'll be able to use while you're in your chamber so you can educate yourself, know the wellness protocols, et cetera. And it's also going to have a couple different levels of technology that we're patenting with new protocols and things like that to make it even more fun and more therapeutic. So yeah, for me personally, it's at Dr. Scott Schur on Instagram. And there's Henshaw Hyperbarics, HBOT Plus uh, from my technology and, uh, yeah, and then of course transcriptions for the methylene blue and transcriptions, trochies, just blue and blue canatine, and Matt has a good discount code as well. What's your discount code, Matt? Blackburn. Yeah, and also put the hyperbaric medical solutions. That's a great website. Too. Yeah, yeah, the hyperbaric medical solutions for uh, for a lot of the research as well, and hyperbaricexperts.com for the mild chambers. Awesome. Right on, Scott. We'll uh, st stick around as I close out the show, and thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much, Matt. This is fun. That's it for today's episode. What do you guys think of Dr. Scott? Super smart, right? And he said he was underslept. I think his brain's working pretty well. Must be all the hyperbaric oxygen therapy and the angiogenesis. That's my favorite part about it, the creation of new blood vessels because 
the odds are really stacked against us for blood flow, oxygen getting to the tissue, the utilization of oxygen. There are so many steps to get to the level of producing ATP and allowing the various tissues throughout our incredible body to function. But I feel like this is just one tool to have in your toolkit, either as a acute use, if something happens, if I hit my head, as Scott mentioned, mild to moderate TBI, traumatic brain injury, I would definitely jump in the hyperbaric tank. And even just for anti-aging purposes, that's why I got into it for health optimization and for a performance enhancement effect. For years, I've felt that humans have been handicapped by deficiencies and toxicities. And I feel like in the mainstream alternative health community, we're focusing on the wrong toxicities and then the wrong deficiencies. That's why I have this show to try to highlight what I believe are the most important toxicities like NPK fertilizer, tap water, green juice, and then the deficiencies, which would be retinol, copper, magnesium, vitamin E, vitamin K2, 7, maybe some niacinamide form of B3 to help with the PUFA problem. I feel like these are really the things to focus on. And I feel like if you have that down and you're on the CLF protocol and you're aware of iron overload and maybe you got the full Monty iron panel to check out your levels, then you're ready for this tool. But I would not recommend this to someone that is you know, keto and intermittent fasting and supplementing fish oil or algae oil. That's just me from my research. Polyunsaturated fatty acids choke the cells and they inhibit oxygen utilization. Whereas whole food C, beef liver, oysters, these are tools that we can use to increase oxygen utilization. As well as systemic enzyme therapy, to tackle the fibrosis, vitamin E to tackle the lipofuscin, magnesium and K2 to tackle the calcification. And then I feel like we're actually making ground. So that's my like personal anti-aging protocol. If you want to call it that. So it is the CLF protocol, but I'm always experimenting with new tools and I'll continue to share that with you guys. But I don't regret purchasing a chamber and using it because I feel like the better I function, the better I will be able to help people. And I truly believe that a lot of the issues on the planet today are because the people thinking of solutions aren't thinking clearly because of CLF, calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis. And they're focusing maybe on mold and heavy metals and glyphosate and all these other things, which matter, but they're not aware of lipofuscin and what that does in the lysosome of the cell, the garbage recycling center of plugging that up so you can't do autophagy and you can't heal even when you sleep. So all that to say is I think that you should prepare If you're interested in getting into hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I'm really just blown away by all the stuff it could do. He mentioned hypoxic inducible factor, HIF, that creates new mitochondria. The whole zombie cell thing, I'd never even heard about that, that hyperbaric oxygen therapy decreases the number of these cells. One of the most mind-blowing to me is that Oxygen can go four times further into the tissue. I thought it was just double, as I said in the interview. 4X, that is tremendous. I I can't imagine the effects that that has systemically on the body. I mean, there's no system it wouldn't touch at that point. And I also didn't know that it creates more exclusion zone water, 
I wasn't expecting that, but that makes sense because if your cells have oxygen, which is the terminal electron acceptor to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of the cell, if that process is working better, then you're going to create more or perhaps more coherent infrared light that allows that exclusion zone water, that gel-like battery water to be created around your cells. And then just everything gets better. Uh, I really like the website hyperbaricexperts.com because there's a whole section on mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy because there's a lot of people that say those soft shells don't do anything. There's not enough research. It's questionable if it's worth it. It's a scam, whatever. But this actually lists the research and studies on MHBOT or mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And that is typically around 1.3 atmospheres of pressure. I'll just read off some of the titles here. Hyperbaric oxygen, more is better, right? Wrong. Lower pressure shown to provide stronger benefit. Mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy shown to help with autism, lowers blood pressure, protects arthritic joints for diabetes, mold-induced cognitive deficits improve, promotes muscular regeneration, autistic children improve from only 10 low-pressure hyperbaric oxygen therapy sessions, mild HBOT for fetal alcohol syndrome, Helps reduce cardiac risks. Parkinson's progression reduced. A lot of stuff on diabetes. A lot of benefits. I mean, it's kind of like talking about molecular hydrogen. I have a hydrogen inhaler that I use here in my office at my desk just to make it healthier to write and do office work. And when we're talking about something as foundational as oxygen or hydrogen, really... There's no limit to what it can benefit. It's like providing the foundational substrate for anything. There's another good website that Scott referenced. It's Hyperbaric Medical Solutions, and they have approved conditions. FDA recognizes, and that's covered by insurance. What's cool is the non-approved conditions, like off-label, that are not generally covered by insurance. Anoxic brain injury, arthritis. Cancer, cerebral palsy, chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic pain, complex regional pain syndrome, concussion and TBI, Crohn's disease, fibromyalgia, inflammatory bowel disease, interstitial cystitis, Lyme disease, migraines, headaches, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injuries, sports injuries, stroke, surgery preparation and recovery, and ulcerative colitis. Almost sounds like one of those corny commercials, right? Side effects may include. But no, there's not side effects if it's mild. And of course, there's not medical advice, but if it's mild and you are able to utilize the oxygen, then it's just a pressurized chamber with more oxygen. And I'm not against using unnatural means, but I feel like we should use it in combination with as many natural therapies as possible. So that website's really cool, Hyperbaric Medical Solutions. Just a lot of info about it. The antimicrobial effect is pretty interesting. I guess it synergizes with different antibiotics. It's anti-inflammatory. Stem cell mobilization increases stem cells and circulation eightfold. And being MitoLife Radio interested in the mitochondria, it actually helps mitochondrial support by increasing oxygen by 1,200% in the plasma. So there's no shortage of oxygen. And it's what's really fascinating, I think Scott brought this up during the interview, that at a certain level, you don't need any red blood cells when you're in a chamber. Like if you didn't have any of the waiters to carry oxygen around, and copper's the chef, right? As Morley says. The red blood cells are the waiters carrying around the oxygen. And copper cuts up the oxygen 
into usable food. If you can have any waiters and you're in a chamber, it has to be a little more than mild, I believe. Then your body could still function. That blows my mind. <laughs> That's pretty wild. So the chamber that I bought, because a lot of people have asked me, is from Henshaw Hyperbarics. I'm going to put the link below. They have multiple different models. I went with the Recline XL. And I believe I'm up to 40 hours as of this recording. They sell deep chambers, but I'm kind of sold on the mild from what I've read about it. I don't think there's a huge benefit, especially going above like 1.4 atmospheres. And there seems to be a lot more risks from what I've heard from Scott. So I'll put the link below to the Integrative Healthcare Symposium talk that Scott did, as well as my link for Methylene Blue. I really like their Just Blue product. Huge fan of it. And I think it synergizes with hyperbaric oxygen therapy just perfectly. So Scott's on Instagram under Dr. Scott Share, And check him out on YouTube. There's a few other lectures up there. Uh, integrativehbot.com. His company is HBOT+. And if you have a chance to use a chamber, try it out. I would much rather do a therapy like this before I did IV blood treatments or mesenchymal stem cell injections, crazy stuff with bone marrow, all the wild stuff that people are doing. I think getting the foundation down first is the most important thing. And to me, that's healing the metabolism, not restricting animal protein or carbohydrate, and getting on the CLF protocol. Then you start to add in some of these advanced therapies. Then you will benefit a lot more. So my website is matt-blackburn.com. I have a lot of cool companies up there that I support, one of which is called Alpha Dynamics, and they actually just recently released a lion's mane formula. I'm actually sipping on it as I speak. It's 3,000 milligrams or three grams of lion's mane. And I do my best to educate people about the medicinal mushroom products you'll find in the health food store being watered down with starch, like 50%, like a drug dealer cutting product. So you're getting a very weak product and less than half of it is actually the active ingredient. So Alpha Dynamics is one of those companies. I've actually met the owners a few times at various health conferences and they have great products that are not watered down, that actually work. So I like the Cordyceps, Reishi, and Lion's Mane packs. I'll just drop an entire pack in my coffee if I'm going to record, blend it up with a little milk frother with some cream, sugar, maple syrup. I'll put in some saturated collagen. And all of this helps to balance out the caffeine that everyone always freaks out about. Uh, I also want to highlight the far infrared sauna from Relax Sauna. That is really beneficial to de stress and for effortless weight loss. It's just you want to make sure to have your minerals in. So, whether it's orange juice or bio ocean shots that I have on my site, the sodium chloride, or just take some sea salt or potassium bicarbonate or coconut wa water, maybe some shilajit. Because there's minerals in your sweat. And so if someone's already deficient in magnesium or potassium and they sweat their butt off in the sauna, then that could be a tremendous stress. What I like about the Relax Sauna is it's very compact and it's very affordable. And it's unique technology with the radiating emitters, the semiconductor ceramic emitters in there that he created because it heats up really fast and it's really hot. I'll often have to open up the zipper throughout the session because it can get a little intense. 
And I used to have a zip up sauna where I would sit completely inside. I couldn't imagine doing it with this one because it would just be too intense. And so it is nice to have your neck out of it. But this is a way to dump radiation, heavy metals, even plastics, which are really hard to get rid of. Anything that's caught in your tissue when the pores open, they can get out. And if you have a shower filter, then you really have the combo going and clean drinking water, of course. So if you use the discount code Blackburn, you save a hundred bucks on that sauna. I think if you live in a small space, an apartment, or you just move a lot, it's a really great way to go. And mitolife.co is the website for the products that I've created. I have Panacea, Pure Sheila G tablets. I have a mix to Coferol, naturally sourced vitamin E. I have Dissolve It All, which is a blend of natokinase and serapeptase. These are very powerful proteolytic enzymes that you take on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. And I put amla in there, a good amount of amla berry, which contains whole food vitamin C, aka copper. So you're simultaneously breaking down scar tissue and providing bioavailable copper to the system so that the tissue can use oxygen as well. And then I have Purely K, which is vitamin K27 is the main ingredient. And that helps to put calcium where it's supposed to go and has a lot of cool effects on the mitochondria and supporting ATP production and cell signaling. And it does a lot of other things other than just regulate calcium. It's a huge vitamin that gets depleted from vitamin D supplementation. Because vitamin K2 will activate proteins like osteocalcin. And if you supplement vitamin D, you increase your requirement to carboxylate or activate osteocalcin. So most people are deficient. They're low in K2 because they've been supplementing D3 for so long. And it's found in all these multivitamin supplements that people are slamming down for a decade or more. And then they have issues that can be traced back likely to a K deficiency, a K2 deficiency. And if you don't want to buy the supplement or you don't like supplementing in general, I always say Parmigiano Reggiano, aged cheese, but you have to eat quite a lot of it. I'm Italian. I love pasta. I'll do the, the whole block of aged cheese. I'll shred it onto the pasta. The pasta is just a delivery mechanism for the cheese. And then I have oyster extract. That's in small batches, usually once a week that will restock. So just keep an eye out for that. One bottle is the equivalent to a little over 13 pounds of oysters. So it's very potent. You don't need much. It's four capsules, pretty much a month's supply. And if you can get the real thing, I always tell people, same with beef liver or ruminant animal liver. Of course, the real thing is better. But if you're traveling, if you're inland like me, then desiccated oyster is a great way to go. And this is a sustainable source from Ireland that each batch is lab tested. So it's a super clean product. There's some risks with eating oysters whole and you can mitigate them. But a lot of people that are compromised might be better to do desiccated oyster. And then I have NAD power. This is niacinamide, a form of vitamin B3. A lot of people are familiar with the niacin flush, L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology. Not the smartest idea because if there's a lot of PUFA in the tissue, you're just releasing them and exploding them when you get that flush, that niacin flush. And if you never heard of it, it causes basically a sunburn. You get super red all over your body. I got really itchy when I took 700 milligrams for the first time. You're supposed to jump on a trampoline pop the niacin, and then get in a sauna. To me, that is just insane, and that doesn't take into context polyunsaturated fatty acids, lipid peroxidation, endotoxin, iron overload, acrolein, all of the breakdown products of PUFAs. Most people have a ton of stored PUFAs in their tissue, so you don't want to explode those with niacin. The niacinamide does the opposite. It actually inhibits the release of fatty acids. It decreases prostaglandin synthesis. 
It suppresses the CERT 1 and 2 gene, which is counterintuitive to the whole resveratrol pitch that you always get that you want to activate those. It's actually the opposite. It's been shown to be neuroprotective, protect against UV-induced skin damage and immune suppression, reduces serotonin synthesis, which is a stress hormone. If it's out of balance, people say, oh, what if I have low serotonin? Well, it's a vitamin, so it's not a drug, right? So it would, it, when you take a vitamin, it's going to help put the body into balance. You know, unless you're taking a whole bottle or something really crazy every day for months and months and months, which people have done that experiment, I generally say stick with the serving size on the bottle. And if you want to experiment, fine. I experiment. I can't recommend it. I generally take personally six capsules of niacinamide because a lot of what I've read in the literature shows 3,000 milligrams or three grams of niacinamide is the benefit. I'll start every, every day with six dissolve it all with some water, and then I'll wait about 30 minutes to eat breakfast. I've moved back to about one capsule of vitamin E with a meal per day. I'll take five Shilajit tablets, four oyster, and usually four to six vitamin K, but that's kind of one I'll cycle high doses. And I have a few other exciting products in the works. Again, it's not about supplementing everything under the sun. I know a lot of people don't like things to be complex, and I try to make it simple. I have a ton of supplements here on my Mito Life Academy private YouTube. I just did a tour of my supplement cabinet. And I don't take everything every day. It's more of a medicine cabinet. That's how I look at supplements. And it's knowing how and why and when to use all of these different tools. So it's tr strategic. Right? We're not just throwing everything in the system. There's a strategy to it. And I lay that out in the CLF protocol blog. So thank you all for the support. Please share this podcast with your friends. New episode released every Friday. Today's quote is from Hyperbaric Experts titled Mild Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy Benefits for Diabetics. Now published in the 2018 Journal of Diabetes, research confirms some of the recently noted benefits of mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy for diabetics, specifically in lowering fasting and non-fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1c, and triglyceride levels, all of which are important markers leading to advanced disease states associated with diabetes. Researchers also focused on skeletal muscle activity and fibers and found that mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy was able to help the muscle's natural ability to use oxygen, which is typically com compromised in diabetics. By helping to sensitize sugar metabolism and oxygen use within the skeletal muscles, Mild hyperbaric oxygen therapy can provide a significant benefit for people with diabetes.